Diane Abbott. Mr Deputy Speaker, my honourable friend, Member for Eccles, made a very powerful case from the dispatch board yeah, early, yeah. early this evening, making the moral case for <coughs> aid. I'm afraid I don't share her optimism about the, the moral sensitivities of Tory government ministers. So I intend in my few brief remarks to make the practical, self-interested case for aid. But I want to begin by stressing that I think it's very important that all these issues of aid and development are put in a wider economic context. And therefore, I welcome the fact that in its motion, the government made reference to its work on the debt question. Because the first thing to say about the question <coughs> of aid that it is quite, quite wrong, as many members on, opposite, opposition ben on the opposite benches would, would do, to present the aid question as if aid is merely a question <coughs> of charity, as if aid is merely a question of handouts to undeserving black and brown people. Yeah, yeah. The facts about the flows of money between Britain, the European Union, America and the Third World is that more money flows from Africa, <coughs> India and the That's rest right. of the third world right. in debt repayment yeah, yeah. than flows to them in aid. Yeah, yeah. And I believe that if you put the aid question in the wider economic question, <coughs> in the wider economic context, particularly the vexed question of debt repayment, then it is possible, I think, to <coughs> see it more clearly. And on the question of debt, as it is mentioned in the government's resolution, let me say this. Let us not forget when looking at the question of debt reduction, how these debts were brought about. If you read the history of the debt crisis in the 70s and 80s, you read a fantastic tale of agents of international banks crisscrossing the third world, urging dictators to take on these debts. Many of this money, much of this money, much of these huge debts never touch the borders of the countries which ostensibly borrowed the money, but is safely stashed in Swiss banks. Many of this money, much of this money was spent on arms. Much of this money never actually trickled down to the peoples of the countries in whose name these debts were incurred. And there is something very cruel and very unfair that as we approach the millennium, the peoples of some of the poorest countries in the world should be toiling to pay the interest on the interest of debts that were incurred in their name by long past military dictators. And the government does speak about its record on debt. And members on these benches do commend the government for its efforts in relation to the Trinidad terms and its <laughs> efforts in relation to changing the way the World Bank looks at debt question. But what I would stress to the government is that, that sadly, past <laughs> efforts at debt reduction have focused on two categories of countries. Either countries like Mexico and the Philippines, <laughs> where it was politically convenient for the US to forgive debt, or on the very poorest countries. And I put it to this house, there are many so-called middle-income countries, like many countries <laughs> in the Caribbean, where social conditions would require this government <coughs> looking much more seriously at debt reduction for these middle-income countries than it has, has done hitherto. The Trinidad terms are very worthwhile. They have involved huge sums of money, but they've actually only began to chip at the weight of debt, even for the poorest countries, and they do not help the deserving populations of many so-called middle-income debtors. And I believe that if this issue of aid is to be looked at properly, it has to be looked at in the context of this country's work on debt reduction, and it has to be looked at in the context of this country's role on the IMF and in the World Bank, because I believe it is long overdue that we review the terms of some of these structural adjustment programmes which we are forcing on third world countries, because I have to say, the record of structural adjustment has not <coughs> been a wholly good one, and in very many of these countries, where structural adjustment has been forced on them by the IMF and the World Bank, the living standards and the education and the basic health care available to ordinary people has fallen behind during the 80s rather than improving. And the other broad framework to the issue of aid that we need to consider is that very sadly, in recent years, we have seen a redirection of flows in aid and other multilateral aid from the very poorest countries, from Africa, to Eastern Europe. And I say this to the House, members on this side of course want to see help for Eastern Europe, but not at the expense of the very, very poorest yeah, peoples yeah. in the world. And at this point, I want to echo what was said by a member opposite of earlier this evening about the question of Commonwealth preference. <laughs> and to say 
how sad and despairing many people were to hear that there is any possibility that the ODA will cut its aid to any part of the world, but in particular the Caribbean. I travel regularly to the Caribbean, particularly to the Jamaica, where my family comes from. And one of the saddest things I often find is when you go to Commonwealth countries, when you go to the Caribbean, when you go to Jamaica, people hold the Commonwealth link in the highest esteem. And you come back to Britain and you sit in this house and you hear government ministers talk about the Commonwealth links yeah. in such a cavalier way. There's something very sad that all over the world, there are countries very often who have a chamber, a replica of this one. Mm -hmm. You step out of the tropical sunlight into a chamber, a replica of this one. Countries which hold the British link and the Commonwealth link in the highest regard. And yet, bit by bit, day by day, month by month, we see government ministers turning away from the Commonwealth. And I think there is a case for a Commonwealth preference in relation to aid. And in the question of the Caribbean, of which I feel most strong, let me put this to ministers. It's all very well to look at the totality of GDP figures in the Caribbean. But what GDP figures mask is increasing poverty and an increasing decline, decline in basic social services in relation to health and education. And let me put this to ministers. Where you have a situation in the Caribbean where you're seeing the collapse of sugar, you're seeing the collapse of the banana industry under the impact of Lome, when you're seeing the ill effects of NAFTA, which means trade that might have gone from America to the Caribbean is now going to countries in the North American free trade area, where you see these things, what does the government think will be the consequence of cuts made to the Caribbean? It will not be an increase in self-reliance and rural labourers getting on their bikes. It will be an increase in the drugs trade. Where traditional yeah, agriculture yeah, yeah. has collapsed in the Caribbean, it has been replaced by the illegal drugs trade. And there's no point government ministers coming to this chamber and talking about the war on drugs while, on the other hand, yeah. the Foreign Office and the ODR pursuing policies designed to create the economic conditions where the growth of the drug trade flourishes. And I believe, because of the historic links, many, many thousands of people in the Caribbean fought this country in the war, helped this country in this war effort. I believe because of the present day links, the very large communities of Caribbean peoples in these countries, and I believe because of the ever-growing menace of the drug trade in the Caribbean, this government should think very seriously before cutting what I believe is already a very low level of aid to the Caribbean. I want to go on and talk about the practical case for aid. I have spent this today upstairs in committee on the immigration and asylum bill. Now, I don't wish to, to, to bring into this debate the details of that bill, but I put it to government ministers. Over and over again, in the context of immigration and asylum, we hear about the waves of economic refugees, and it is certainly true. When we look at the world map, we see the continents of the world crisscrossed by waves of refugees driven by the four horsemen of the apocalypse, war, famine, poverty, and pestilence. But what is the point of incre having increasingly punitive and criminalizing message against measures against economic refugees if we do not, in our aid program, address the causes of economic refugees? I'm not saying that it is practical at this point for Britain to open its doors to economic refugees, but I think it is heartless and impractical not to see that one of the aims of our aid and development work ought to be to, to deal with the causes of economic refugees and ought to be directed at, at some of these countries to help to bring about development and growth. I mean, and, and the, the idea that members opposite have that a practical approach to aid means misusing aid as a form of soft loans for arms deals and dubious construction projects, I think that's wholly impractical. What we want is aid used to promote growth and development in these countries, and that will be the only really effective check for the waves of economic refugees, because nobody, surely in this house, seriously believes that people leave Africa and the Indian subcontinent and the third world to sit in a damp council flag in Hackney and live on benefits. They leave because they are driven by poverty, and our aid programme should not be directed to helping arms deals, it should be directed towards the relief of yeah, poverty. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and our aid programme should not be abused in other ways. It is bizarre that the country of Dominica, alone mm -hmm. in the Caribbean, is getting extra aid. Why? Because it's willing to take a refugee that is no longer con 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 convenient for, for, for the British to keep within their borders. That, that, to me, that is another abuse of the aid programme. The fact is that although the Prime Minister <laughs> claimed in the Queen's speech that the commitment to overseas aid would be maintained, ever since the Conservatives came to power, investment in aid has gone down and down. And I put it to this House that there is not just a moral case 
but there is a present-day economic, internationally self-interested case. <coughs> First of all, in cementing the very strong relationships with Commonwealth countries like the Caribbean in the context of the aid programme, and continuing to deliver an aid programme program which is directed not to the interests of um, construction companies, not to the interests of arms dealers, but to the interests of the poorest peoples in the world who need relief from poverty. Yeah. Yeah. Robert Key. Yeah.